So now, does the Fama French model explain this variation in average returns across the portfolios? Let's look at the main part of the table. This is a beautiful table because they tell you right on top regressions, what regression they ran. So that lets you know what all the numbers in the table are. So what does this table tell us? Well, we're supposed to look for higher betas when there's higher expected returns. So they show us the betas. Here's the Bs, the Ss, and the H. The Bs aren't doing anything. They're all about 1.0. The Ss rise from minus 0.25 to 1.18. As we go in this way, that regression coefficient goes up. And the H's rise from minus 0.27 to plus 0.63. As we run that way, the H coefficients go up. So this is showing you in detail where the expected returns were higher in that direction and that direction, we also see the betas are higher in that direction and that direction. What do Fama and French say about the table? Let's look at what they say on uh, page uh, 57. Table 1 reports estimates of the three-factor time series regression 2. If the model describes expected returns, the intercepts should be close to zero, and they say, by and large, the intercepts are close to zero. Let's look at the intercepts. That, of course, is what the model is. It's the test of the model, if you will. The intercepts of the time series regression are the errors of the cross-sectional regression. What we're looking at that in those intercepts is how far are the assets off of the line relating expected returns and betas. So are they small, as Fama and French say? Well, most of them are small. Uh, most of them are in the 0.05 range. So always first look at the economic size of a coefficient before you look at statistics. The numbers were 0.3 to 1.1. What's left over is 0.05. So the glass is, these aren't numbers aren't zero, but the glass is quite full. Uh, the amount that's explained is, is very large compared to this, which is the amount that's unexplained. They're not all zero. There's a minus 0.45, for example, and a 0.20 that Fama and French are, are perfectly honest about. Let's look at statistical significance. All those small ones, in fact, are statistically significant with a 4.19 t-stat. Most of them uh, are, are small statistically and economically with a few that are left over that the model doesn't explain. It's not a perfect model, like all models aren't perfect models. Now, there's more stuff in this table. Uh, this is a table of regressions. You've seen regressions y equals uh, x beta plus z. These are a regression like any other regression. And the table gives you a list of t-statistics on these betas. The t-statistics are really impressive. So is that a good measure of this model? You're used to seeing big t-statistics being a good regression. Are the big t-statistics on these regression coefficients important as a way of saying this is a good model? I hope you came to the conclusion, no, they're not. This model is not about the t-statistics of the betas. That tells you that these are well measured. That's nice to know. But it's not a test of the model whether these things are big or not. This model is about average returns versus betas, not the betas themselves. Another thing you're used to looking at in regressions is the r-squared. So what's the r-squared of this regression? They tell us the r-squared of this regression. And the r-squareds in this regression are huge. They're in the 0 0.93, 0 0.95 range, very large R-squareds. Now, you're used to thinking from regression classes that a big R-squared is a good measure. So is that the, the fact that the R-squared is big, is that a test of the Fama French model? Does that tell us it's a good model? I hope, again, you came to the right conclusion. No, <laughs> the Fama French model is not about the R-squared. Uh, now, the R-squared is an interesting observation, and when we look at what Fahm and French say on page 56, what do they say about the performance of their model? They say, at a minimum, the evidence suggests that the three-factor model is a parsimonious description of returns and average returns. Why do they repeat that, that word returns twice? Well, they're making both points. The R-squared tells us that this model explains variation over time in the returns. It's about that time series regression. The alpha 
being small tells us that the model explains variation across the portfolios in the average returns. These are two totally different concepts. The major point that we're after is explaining the average returns. It's also interesting, but a minor point, that the model explains the variation over time in the individual returns as well as the variation across assets and average returns. This is what the model is about. The average returns versus the betas. Uh, many authors actually use a, a the, we could think of a cross-sectional R-squared. How big are the alphas compared to the variation in expected returns? That would be an R-squared measure that might make sense of the basic point. It's a dangerous measure, which is why Fahm and friends don't use it. But that is what the main point of the model is about. The R-squared point is interesting. It tells us if you have a, a factor model with an R-squared of 1, that would tell you that the covariance of all 25 assets is driven by this, by this one or three factors. It tells you there's a strong factor structure. It tells you it's a good model of explaining covariance, but it doesn't tell you that it's a good model of explaining means. And we're here to explain means. So that is, in a sense, the, the mind-blowing fact of Fama and French's table. You're used to seeing a table with regressions in it, and thinking that the explanatory power of that regression is how good the model is. That's not what this table is about. This is a table of data. And you have to then mentally make the regression to see whether the Bs and Ss are high where the expected returns are high. They want to show you the facts. They don't want to show you uh, th that that's not the regression in this table is only there to produce the data. I did it uh, in the graph I showed you on the first day. I made the same point visually. Where the expected returns are high is where the H coefficients are high. That's what the point of this table is. The regressions are only there to measure the Bs and, and the Hs and so forth. Now, you might ask yourself, wait a minute. If this is data, let's test the model. Uh, where is the test of the Fama and French model? Well, it's right here. Let's go back and read what Fahm and French say about the test of the model. The way you test a model of average returns is you ask, are all the alphas jointly zero? And there's a standard statistical test of that question. It's called the Gibbons, Ross, and Shankin test. And Fahm and French tell us, I'm reading from page 57, the F test rejects the hypothesis <laughs> that the average returns uh, are, are explained by the model at the 0.004 level. Savor this for a minute. This, the most famous paper of the last 40 years, the most influential model, the paper that this model took over the world after the publication of this paper is destroyed by statistical tests at, at any level you want. <clears throat> How, what are we doing? Well, the point of this paper, the point of showing you all the data, is to show you that the glass is 90% full. Now, a statistician can prove to you that it's not 100% full. That small growth portfolio is statistically significant. This is not a perfect model. But it's a very interesting that the way they showed this data convinced the world that this, though statistically rejected, uh, the glass is 90% full, this is a pretty darn good model. And in doing so, they really set a style for empirical work. They took all of finance away from pure hypothesis testing and towards getting into the data and showing us the extent to which models work and, and don't work. Next, how do Fahm and French go on and use the three-factor model? 